Thank you for learning Siebel with the Siebel Hub. We have a unique, comprehensive and always up-to-date collection of Siebel CRM 2021 training classes. We can deliver live online and on-site training in the highest quality with the most experienced instructors. And we also offer a unique modular Siebel CRM 20 and 21 training. Follow the links in the description or on this slide to learn more and learn Siebel with the Siebel Hub. Hi, everybody. Oh, hi, Chris. Chris. Hi, Christian. Hello. Hi. Hello. Guten Abend nach Nürnberg. <laughs> Karlsruhe. Oh, Karlsruhe. Okay. 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 Alles, alles klar. So, if we have some time at the end, did anybody make the migration from Windows to Linux with Siebel in here? Good. Good question. Anyone? Well, I didn't make a migration, but I use both environments. <laughs> so uh, we have a 20 year running. So in, in two months, the application will be 20 years old. Wow, Siebel oh. 2000. Yes, 6.02 <laughs> was, the, no, 6.2.1 6 was the introduction there when we start there is this windows emulator thingy for linux isn't it <laughs> i think this is not the point so the point is <laughs> if we want to go on docker and everything new we have to to switch to linux okay well and but it, we are struggling with log files and file interfaces and clip calls and Wow, very special things. So okay, that sounds that sounds very very interesting. So I I do hope we I I will just make time for this just to maybe dissect the problem and so, and learn yes, why. So so we are we are at the first step in thinking about Docker. So if anybody has uh, done the way, it would be nice to yeah to talk okay about good, experience. Good, a good point. Yeah, this uh, yeah. that's what Siebel Friday is for to to check out new things and discuss uh, things. So good point, Christian. Yeah. So uh, let, let me start with um, a little bit uh, on the on the uh, update side, uh, as we have skipped um, one, one Siebel Friday. So I'm going to quickly um, cover the 21.10 and 21.11 highlights. So you're up to date. Uh, as is like the, the regular thing on the Siebel Friday, we, we just analyze what Oracle, yeah, brings up on us with the new updates. So the 21.10, of course, it was, that's also included in 21.11, so <laughs> of course. Um, so when you update to 21.11, you get a new feature, which is actually quite interesting, is uh, announced as officially integration with Oracle Unity customer data platform. So you have to understand what Oracle Unity is and do we actually use it? And probably you say, well, we're not using Unity. You're not interested in that. But there is actually a new, a new EAI layer being added onto Siebel, which you can use for anything as long as you're happy with CSV files being dumped on a, a drive or a cloud bucket and that's interesting. That's the thing I would like to focus on. And also there's, um, you see there's a new feature in 21.10 called repository version tracking, uh, bookshelf updates, uh, and along with new instructions, how to rename repositories. Uh, so let's take a look at this Unity thing. Has has anyone, anybody, anybody using it or heard about it? Vaguely. You're not using it. You heard about it. Yeah. No. Not from my side. Yeah. So it, it's one of those CX, Oracle Cloud CX modules that Oracle announces as kind of the augmentation layer for Siebel. Siebel being part of CX, but you can use all the, all the other good stuff from the CX cloud. And Unity plays an important role, especially when you look at this feature here, uh, which uh, I need my drawing tools here with my my pen. Yeah, uh, here when it says smart segmentation, 
rings a bell segmentation no uh, uh, nobody using Siebel marketing like yeah, yes, well, marketing good. analytics yeah. segmentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah Siebel marketing using Siebel analytics back in Siebel 2000, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, OBIE, yes. OBIE. And there's a segmentation module in OBIE where you can, well, ingest the the data from Siebel and create segments and then make campaigns uh, for these segments. The the thing is that Oracle or Oracle. BI is now Oracle Analytics, o OAS or o OAC, uh, on premises on cloud, but the Oracle Analytics no longer has the segmentation module. So Oracle is actually replacing that with the Unity feature, which is, uh, uh, if you've seen the demos uh, online, and there was a demo in the in the virtual summit just just a week ago. Um, so it's quite clever, uh, quite good looking but you have to bring the data to Unity. And the integration is actually all about, well, pushing out CSV files and Unity is using those CSV files. So that's, uh, let me just clear that up. So do you think that um, people that are on OBIE now are gonna have to migrate to this Unity thing eventually? Well, well if you're an OBIE and, and then migrate to Oracle Analytics, I, I think the answer is yes. There's no one from Oracle here, as far as I can see. But okay. I, I'm speculating that the answer is yes because uh, there is just no segmentation in OAS. It's not there. Right, which is like one of the main features, right? So yeah, it's one of those. Was. Yeah, the, uh, a lot of things actually got got um, kicked out, uh, including the uh, these uh, what's it called uh, score. Uh, no, those special dashboard KPIs and scorecards. There was one thing that was in OBIE and is no longer in OAS. So they kicked out all the, let's say, annoying stuff, maybe. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, that's that's one reason. But Unity is not just even if you don't don't using uh, if you're not using Siebel marketing at all, or you're not interested in segmentation. Unity can play a role in your strategy or not, I'm not trying to sell it <laughs> but by all means. Uh, I have never used it, to be honest, but the CSV export is interesting as you get a new screen, administration data export. And if you look closely, it says engine here and search categories. And that had a, and maybe you're using Siebel search, the, the search engine integration with, uh, the Oracle Secure Enterprise Search also being deprecated as we speak, or even Elastic. So you have a search engine and you have search categories, which basically is a, a wrapper for business components and fields. And it's built on that architecture. It actually, it's built upon the search architecture. So you can do a, a full export of, you, you, in that screen, you simply select what do you want to export? Hit export or export all, and then it exports all the objects. Uh, you can define filters. So if you have, let's say, millions of contacts, that would be a bit heavy, uh, but it, as it would export all the contacts in your database. Um, and it will just dump them into a folder you specify as CSV. So, and that's it. it there's no unity as a, uh, you can just, in use the CSV with any other software, like a, you know, business intelligence or you name it. Even if you don't use Unity, uh, you still might be interested in that data export screen. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, speaking of demo, I, I have a live system. So let's see that in action. So here's my, uh, no, that's the wrong system, of course. Uh, so yeah, here here I got uh, plain Siebel. I think it's twenty one dot ten. Let's verify. Yeah, twenty one dot ten. And I've already set it up for the export. So uh, even for incremental. So um, just before I'm going into detail, I'm going to make an update to uh, to random contact here. So let's update the phone number. Um, yeah and step off. So 
it's also set up for incremental export. And now let's go to the um, to the new screen, data export. So there it is. And yeah, the first first view is really the engine, but that's that's seed data. You get that when you update. Uh, the seed data is inserted as well, so you don't have to enter anything here, but you have to enter a few parameters. So I will explain that parameters in a bit. Uh, but basically, I have I have the full full mojo because export only is no. That means it does not only export to CSV; it also transfers it to my Oracle Cloud bucket. I have a bucket on the Oracle Cloud called Siebel CSV, so that that's going to happen as well. But if you go to that other view, the data export settings, uh, you have these search categories. So if you look into this, if you drill down on one of these search categories, uh, it's easy to understand. It's just a business component reference, maybe a filter or not, and then the fields you want to export. It's the same for if you go to a few called search categories, it's actually exactly the same. So it's really piggybacking on the search engine. So now let me let me click, uh, maybe pick a small one, exchange rates for Unity, and I click export. You see it kicks off a job for the search data processor. So all you have to do is bring that online, the search component group, and I can refresh it. It's probably, yeah, it's already done. So the job, and now I specified the temp folder. Uh, and you see the exchange rate CSV file has just been generated here. So there, there's that. And there's also an incremental file created for that contact, which I updated. You see, just one, one record in there. Mm -hmm. So it will it will actually incrementally create files for every business component that I update here that I have listed here. So contacts, products, addresses. Um, I can add I can add to this list. And uh, let's see, it has already exported them. So let's just try. Let me log into my Oracle Cloud. So that's my my private cloud of sp of sorts. <laughs> that's the one I'm using. Um, and no, not instances. Sorry, I want to go to buckets. So buckets is the object storage, where you, well, you just just simply upload files and stuff. So I've created a folder, uh, a bucket here. That's a bucket, and you can have folders and already tested it a lot. As you can see, the files have arrived. So let's see if there's uh, from today, 26. Uh, it's quite a lot. And contacts, yeah. The increment, I think that's the ones just arrived. Yeah, so files are uploaded. Whenever they're generated on the Siebel server, they are also uploaded to the bucket you have specified. And from here, that's the point from Oracle, from here, Unity can pick them up. So that's the that's the point. And even if you delete the record, the incremental file will have the information that's been deleted and Unity can take action. So there's a mapping in Unity. And I'm by, by no means a Unity expert, but there's a nice demo out there. Now, so cool. So checks deleted records? Uh, sorry, say again. Does it track the deleted record? Uh, yes, and it actually the the, the technique is interesting uh, because it tracks insert, update, delete, and it wow. does it does that simply by relying on on the transaction processor, you know, from Siebel Remote. <laughs> so you actually have to enable uh, <laughs> transaction logging. Uh, Siebel and six is back. Yes, <laughs> Siebel two thousand is back. Uh, now the component group is called Mobile Sync, but that's where the transaction processor is. So if you want that incremental export, in addition to bulk export capability, you bring the transaction processor online, 
and there's a system preference. To, there's the transaction logging you have to enable, and then you have to have a repeating job. So, the, and the job repeating time drives how often it looks up for changes. But the transaction processor, you know, with the transaction log tables, etc., it, it has a yeah seamless tracking of insert, update, delete. And when you further enable the the bucket upload, so that's another step. Let's say it's like a three stage rocket. And the third stage is you set export only to no. And there's a new business service, which is, uh, yeah, black boxed, unfortunately, but it runs on the SES Tomcat. It's like one of these Java business services and it handles the export to the OCI. So you specify your, your, your user account and fingerprint and private key file. It's all very secure. So it uploads to the, to the cloud. Yeah, so. The the definition of the fields was in here. It was in the search engine definition, or uh, yeah, right. Let, let me which fields you want to export? I think this was this yeah, search you, engine thing. Right. That's the search categories. It's just yes. a, yes. It's, it's yes. the same thing, mm -hmm. and you have the fields for either for the business component. Okay. To specify that here. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So if you go to search categories, it looks exactly the same. It's just renamed. Yeah. App, copies of applets and stuff. So, yeah, and of course, it doesn't have to be named for Unity. It's just the name Oracle mm -hmm. chose for the seed for the seed examples. Works perfect. I, I tried it with other business components. Works perfectly fine for any data that is on a let's say real business component with a you know it ha must have a Siebel base table. Um, obviously, it doesn't doesn't work with uh, you know virtual PCs or EBCs. That's not not part of that. So yeah, here's, I also have this on, on the Siebel hub block. So um, there's the, the whole architecture is built on existing infrastructure, search, search and transaction processor. Um, but you have two new business services, essentially one CSV export adapter service and OOS Oracle object storage file upload service. Okay, so so that's one feature that might be worth exploring, even if you're not <laughs> not using Unity. Yeah. Is that... uh, okay. Uh, any comments? Yeah, please shoot. Uh, <laughs> then I'll try to keep it snappy as this is all recorded. And um, the repository version tracking is actually a new column in the workspace version table which is introduced when you update through the post-install database update. And it gets populated with actually 17.0. Um, and only if you run the repository upgrade, the, the non-mandatory repository upgrade part, then basically it updates to the, to the number of that repository that could be 21.10 or 21.11. And it, there's also a new field in the technical support applet which shows that repository version. So Oracle support actually knows that your database is not just updated, it's also upgraded. That's because there's now a mix of, you know, different information in the customer repositories as to what did the customer do? Did they just update or run the repository upgrade? And what version did they run it? So what do they have in the design repository or not? So it could be very confusing. And that's why this was introduced. And uh, speaking of post-install database update, now the exit codes that you find in the log file, they are now in Bookshelf, which is great. So you can see what to what it translates, like if you get, get return code 12, what does it mean, <laughs> success or not? And some of you might have seen the, the report, which now has the, the big green thing or big red thing, if you're, if you're out of luck, uh, to, to point out this was okay or this was not okay. Even checkboxes for each, uh, you know, section. So anyone seen the big green thing or red thing? Not yet, mine's still red. Yours is going red. Yeah, we got, we just yeah I had troubles with it. I had to go back to 21.5. 
<laughs> start all over again. Oh, and and, and who else saw it? Uh, this is the other Nick. Uh, yeah, we just did the twenty one dot ten, and uh, everything was successful. We had oh. some bugs in an earlier version that was failing, but um, this one finally worked. Oh, great to hear! Yeah. So, so yeah, so now they got it fixed up. The report is fixed up because in earlier versions there was a big green and red thing at the same time, and it was a bit confusing. <laughs> so now it seems to be stable. And uh, an important change, which is just a tiny side note in Bookshelf, but I think it's important that the the job of renaming repositories after a full migration, you know, you have a second repository if you run the migration application full mode. And there was just SQL to rename those repositories, basically migrated to Siebel and before that the existing Siebel to something else, uh, old Siebel repository. And 2110 or higher is no longer supported to run direct SQL to, well, the Oracle never likes to run direct SQL. Uh, doesn't, nobody likes the idea of, uh, yeah, random people pushing in random SQL against the Siebel database. So Oracle has an official tool for it, which is the, the SIPDEF CLI, which gets a lot of, of love probably. Uh, it's the, you know, the headless, the headless Siebel tools that's also on Linux. So, but you have to run it on the RR, on the target environment where you might be on a Linux machine with, with no CFG file because there's no Siebel tools on it. Uh, so you have to figure out your CFG file. Uh, it's essentially a Siebel tool CFG file you could copy over. Um, and then uh, use the switch to migration repository switch. And the first string is the is the the value of the name for the old Siebel repository. So it can be anything. Uh, but the second string is Siebel repository because that's the name where the migrated repository will be renamed to. Took me a while to figure that out. So and there's also a note on Oracle support that they got the documentation a little bit, yeah, misunderstandable. And as you see on this on the screenshot, it just just doesn't run the, the it does the renaming of course, but it it does through a business service that you might already heard about the Siebel Runtime Metadata Publisher service. So that's also the one you have to run to activate tasks or workflows in earlier versions after the migration. And that also takes care of long running workflow processes. So it's uh, probably a starter, a Kickstarter, and will do more jobs um, in, in one, uh, like one call after the migrate repository is migrated and you have all this stuff uh, settled. Okay, and mouse wheel support. <laughs> That's the one where everybody goes woohoo. Finally, it really works. Let me, let me show you. So here, let's go to uh, uh, where to have records, contacts, all contacts. Um, I'm using the mouse wheel right now, yeah. Wow, <laughs> how cool is that? Uh, it goes by record set. I like missed the single record out. rolling though. Uh, you mean record by record? or? Yep. Yeah, Siebel no longer does that. No, even the button goes goes set by set. Yeah. Where did you change that? They change the the, the record by record. The, the go to yeah. next record in list applets that was abandoned with IP seventeen. When when the when the button was no longer doing re, uh, uh, next record. Yeah. And. Actually, that, that gave me a flashback because one of the first things I, I implemented in OpenUI back in IP13 or so, and I even put it in the OpenUI handbook, was to support mouse wheel. So there is somewhere there, there's a physical renderer out there which adds the support. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's of course cool to support the mouse wheel. Also in web tools, like quite gets, yeah, gets a little bit easier to use. But uh let's skip that for timing and and 2111 because speaking of web tools there's just one feature 2111 that's the web tools sif import actually so there's sif export for a while now 
web tools can export zip files, but it has the export has been now fully enhanced, like uh, more similar to what you have in Siebel tools. And there's also an import driven by a task UI. Who, who would have who would have known task UI gets so much attention? Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe let's check that out. I, I have a tool. I have a machine here with, with tools. Let me just check tools. Oh yeah, uh, actually, if, if you have a new menu archive, then you know in 2111 or higher. <laughs> yeah, that, that's new menu it adds. So basically export uh, works all the way as it did. So you can call it from the archive menu now, add to archive or the uh, uh, applet menu. It was, always, it was always in the applet menu. Uh, and that does the, it, now it, it's different. It adds it, it just doesn't download the zip file straight. It adds it to a list of things you wanna export, much like Siebel tools. No, you keep that list open, we go somewhere else uh, and find the thing and then uh, add that to the archive. Okay, I will, and now you can still edit the list. You can delete stuff before you actually hit export. It's very much like Siebel tools now. Uh, and so the workspace and version, uh, um, how do you say that, aware, workspace and version aware in that if you now go to a different workspace, uh, I can do that. <laughs> I find I have one open with SIF. Yeah, let's open this one. So I'm op opening a workspace. Yeah. And if I do an export now, it will export as of that version uh, in the same SIF file. So that's, of course, that could cause all kind of trouble, I think. <laughs> so workspace open, and now let's find something else. A nice little view. And add that to the archive. So that opens the panel always. Now you see, there's the workspace name and version. So let's let's hit export, and um, there's the object zip file that I get. And I, of course, it's in the downloads folder, and I can move it. So that works fine. And what about the import? Let's try and import. So you pick a SIF file. Uh, actually, I, I do that quite often. The repository upgrade has SIF files. So I want to know what's in the repository upgrade. Uh, it's quite a big one. So it's actually for Mac. Uh, so it's also stress testing. Uh, so now as this all runs on the server, it's much faster. I, at least uh, my perception. Because this is a huge SIF file, has all these standard objects. Mouse wheel again. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's the that's a task UI, so it's nice nicely done. And looks uh, it looks almost exactly like the Siebel Tools wizard. If you go next, um, probably takes a while because now there's really a lot of data it has to retrieve. Oh no! Well, <laughs> okay, that could be slower. So here you have that tree representation. You know, we can see for each product, is it in the repository or not? What is the, if that action drop down or that resolution drop down, you can set for, for merge. Uh, so we'd have to go for as one field, which, well, it's, it's just, there's no, it's no real merge. It's just in the file. Yeah. But anyway, you, you see the, you see the, the pattern here. So, well, how cool is that? Import zip files, cool. import zip files in your browser. Now, <laughs> one, one less thing to use Siebel tools for it. <laughs> and that's, um, yeah, hopefully uh, speeding up. So see, we can say bye-bye to Siebel tools quite soon and focus on web tools. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, that's still, the odd, the odd little thing you have to do in Siebel. Well, all of the wizards except the, the only wizard. Let me cancel out of this. 
the only wizard that's still in web tools is the web service and uh, it's missing like 20 wizards still yeah. way to go okay but yeah that's that's that um so they did also document the workspaces much better too this time oh, oh yeah that's uh, that's actually what you see here um the uh the bookshelf the siebel tools guys are worth definitely worth a look now if you ever yet you know need to get to grips again with what workspaces really are so this chapter on workspaces has been completely rewritten by by brian who's not here today but it's, it's brian kelly who has uh, joined us so often and uh yeah i think he deserves a lot of uh praise for taking up the task uh certainly to to clarify the content here so it's very very good very well written yeah and also i noticed the eim guide got a lot of updates for lovs because that was always ambiguous how how to properly migrate lovs with eim not that i've done it ever but if you really want to go that down that track and the ucm guide also has uh, some very old obsolete stuff removed which was getting a little bit dusty. So yeah, it's good to see Oracle is working on the um, the bookshelf as well. It gets updated every month. So make sure you check out the you know these what's new chapters and check out. Okay, this guide has been changed. It's easy to spot the guides that have been changed, and then check out the chapter what's new and um, yeah, see see for yourself if you can use the information. All right. Uh, next thing I would like to point out, uh, pr preaching to the <laughs> preaching to you, uh, the thing is that um, on the Siebel Hub we are working uh, very heavily now on getting new training out there. So watch out for twenty two. Uh, there will be all all the classes will be updated to Siebel twenty two. <laughs> But one that will be in January, hopefully, or February. And uh, OpenUI is already updated, as it's like not really necessary to wait for Siebel 22 for OpenUI, learning OpenUI, right? It's out there for almost 10 years. Um, and we had that, that class, OpenUI Basics and Professional, we had that up for a while, but only with uh, self-study materials, so PDFs. And now we have full-grown video training so you see the modules here. So if yourself or anybody in your team or anybody you know needs to get a firm grip on OpenUI, uh, that's, yeah, I I hate to brag, but it's probably the best training and the most up-to-date training you can get <laughs> in, 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 online, in an online on-demand format. So yeah, let me just share the, in the chat, let me just share the, um, URLs for the basic training and also the uh, professional training. So professional built on the basic training, but if you if you have a, a, a solid grip of OpenUI uh, and still you know want to uh, do the weird the weird stuff that's <laughs> really challenging, then we have a lot of interesting chapters like data visualization or integrating UPT and test automation, or uh, building a custom UX with uh, actually Vue.js and Nexus Bridge from IdeaPort. So uh, that it goes that far, so. Okay, so just a little bit on the marketing side here. Hope, hope that's fine with you and hope to see you uh, in an open UI class soon. And then let me check my notes here. Yes. Uh, and the other thing, uh, speaking of, yeah, that's that's my my segue here. Uh, speaking of web frameworks or Nexus Bridge, essentially, has has anybody um, worked with the Nexus Bridge? Not yet. Not yet. So uh, it's a it's a product from uh, IdeaPort Riga, the, uh, we, who also happen to join us often on Siebel Friday in good um, good terms with them. And IdeaPort has 
built this in the yeah in 2019 already so it's like two years up and oracle actually well approves of it uh, that's I'm not sure if that's a correct legal term but it's not an oracle uh, library of course but it's the library that oracle has verified uh, for validity so and um, i've seen a lot of customers actually picking it up for their well advanced open ui redesign of the of the whole ux uh, user experience and well while i was while i was building the the content for the professional class i um, i was trying to put together examples for nexus bridge and i was thinking of the uh siebel to phone um, demo i had uh, it's a it's a quite old demo that allows you to bring siebel to smartphones any siebel application and uh I, it it was it was it was uh, long before Nexus Bridge existed. So basically, um, I redesigned it to use Nexus Bridge. So here it is. So that's the the, the next version of Siebel to phone. I call it Siebel to two phone because it's uh, Siebel twenty two ready. And uh, so this one uses Nexus Bridge, for example, to implement um, the infinite scrolling. So if I scroll down here, you see it stops shortly, or let's let's pick a bigger view uh, accounts probably. And this is uh, this is Siebel call center. Um, so the desktop application on the phone. And you see if I scroll down very fast, you see it stops for a while, retrieves the next thirty record um, from the applet. Uh, so it fed, it does the fetch the. Go to next record set while you scroll down and that um, that's not a list applet anymore that's like um, rendering all this content manually uh, if i scroll up it's even faster because i simply do the trick of keeping all that stuff in the browser not deleting it so uh, the scrolling experience if you will is very good now uh, not that i would encourage you know i i don't want i don't want to encourage the idea of scrolling down thousand records and scrolling up again uh, the DBAs would kill me, uh, but still, it's like people expect that to to be quite swift. Uh, and also, if you like hold and click an icon, you get um, a like of pop. No, it's not a really pop up, but you get the details displayed, and you have buttons to make a call to the phone number on your phone or or edit. Uh, so that's a little bit more like the the idea that I convey with Siebel to phone. Uh, and this is just a physical renderer you put on your list applets. So make your list applets appear nicely on the phone or even on on a tablet sized device. Well, of course, it's wasting a lot of space now, but that's the, the tablet. And let me just prove this is real Siebel call center uh, by, by logging out. And by the way, do you like the dark theme? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I thought I went. I go. I go dark for once. And I never did a dark theme before, so it's my first time. Uh, so now I'm, I'm uh, toggling off the the mobile emulation in that browser. So you see Siebel Call Center right Oh, here. But when I log in from a desktop device, it goes into plain standard call center. It's the same application. It's just you know, it's a, it's actually uh, the manifest expression. It's detecting a uh, mobile device and then kicking in the custom physical renderers and custom style sheets. So you can use the same application. People can just, you know, go outside and uh, pull up their phone and say, ah, oh, I want to call this guy and bring up a number. So keep it simple. The whole mobility should be really uh, nice and simple, right? Uh, not the complex desktop application you try to squeeze on the phone, which is some projects did and failed miserably. <laughs> you need a license for the phone? Uh, the Siebel 22 phone is uh, open source, so it's on the um, on GitHub, MIT license. There's already one version on it, which is not as clever with because it doesn't use the Nexus bridge, but I'm, I'm, I'll publish the new version in a few weeks. And if you want to give it a um, a whirl on your application, just let me know. Uh, we can have a, f a session where I show you how to install it, and then you 
can see how it acts on your list applets and on your on your data because it should work on any standard list applet and grid layout applet cool yeah. without without intervention so you don't have to change a thing uh, besides from well adding stuff to the manifest <laughs> but you don't have to change web templates or you know layouts it's all picking it's picking up what's there uh, and then uh, I talked to a customer about this and the customer was in Germany and Germany has notoriously bad mobile coverage. So yeah, you, you would agree, Christian uh, and, and Florian. Hi, Florian. Uh, that when you are on a train in Germany, it's no fun browsing the internet on your phone. And, well, it could be. Now it has improved much, <laughs> but... Uh, you just so go offline. Yeah, that's right. And the problem with putting Siebel on your phone is you put the Siebel Open UI stack on your phone. That's like nine megabytes of data it has to download. Uh, Frank asks you don't use the dedicated mobile applications. No, no, it's just you could use them. Yes, it would work with those applications as well, but you can use your desktop application. Yeah. Uh, so I, I thought about this these nine megabytes of of javascript and css that Siebel open ui just requires <laughs> literally to download and that's impossible on a slow uh, mobile connection uh, I, I thought about the other option which some customers pursue today is to go completely back end with Siebel. you know Siebel just headless uh, with the rest api and yeah, I've been I've been experimenting with the REST API and supporting customers with REST API quite a lot. So I thought, why not why not write the the tiniest application possible <laughs> with my limited abilities of of JavaScript? I I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call myself a, a front end expert. You see, that's a very crude approach. But this is a JavaScript file, a, Java, a bunch of JavaScript functions. It's like ridiculously small to so go to sources here uh siebel app dot js <laughs> and siebel app dot css for a bit of styling and that is like yeah 400 lines of code uh to actually be able to call into the siebel rest api and establish a tiny little data model in the browser so you can define what account means and what contact means and so when I click here, uh, it's really retrieving the data from Siebel through the REST API, to, through the data API. Uh, I added a little bit of search. So let's search for M, yeah, with M in the name. Yeah, so that's, that's okay. A little bit of CSS for styling. And when you click a record, you can edit it. You can define which fields you want to edit. Of course, there's no MVGs and fancy stuff like drop downs. It's so very simple now. Let's just change this and click save. And save button goes green, so it all went well and uh, it's saved in the, in the database. So it using the REST API, of course. Uh, and, and this you can put, uh, I, I, I plan to put it on GitHub as well as a demo how to use the REST API in Siebel. Uh, it's also part of the new workshop we're designing. Uh, we learned the REST API. Uh, so it's a live example you can put on your uh, AI server. You, you, put the, you put those three files on the Tomcat. And you see, it's, it's called Siebel app slash index HTML. And when you actually load it, you're prompted to log in. So you have to log in with a valid Siebel user. Let's choose Terry here. Yeah, and it's uh, super fast and swift because it's, it's no fuss. There's no JavaScript running apart from the absolute necessities and there's no formatting going on. Yeah, so that, that was an idea I had and I'll put it into, uh, into the workshop and also it will appear on GitHub uh, in, yeah, after, after Christmas probably. So if you're interested in putting that on your Siebel application, uh, let me know, and we can, uh, yeah, can have a have a session together and uh, for free, <laughs> so it doesn't cost a thing. And uh, I I'll get to test it on a real customer system, and you get to you get to understand how it works on your system. So, 
So you're looking for guinea pigs, huh? Yes, I'm looking for guinea pigs, yes. <laughs> you want to be my guinea pig? <laughs> of course, anytime. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so it's just really a trend that, and that Oracle started that trend, you know, with DX4C, creating a completely new application in the cloud, but Siebel is the backend with the REST API, I think. That's a little bit of, is a new era of Siebel where, yeah, you don't mess around with open UI at all. Uh, you just create your new UI. So, yeah, you need to hire a web designer to make this really pretty, but yeah. Web so designer. you're using database authentication, correct? Uh, well, this is just actually the trick is um, I take what the user enters and it goes through the AI object manager. So it does a regular session. And if the if password is wrong, it fails. So whatever the AI object manager is using, like could be, you know, SSO or whatever, or LDAP, it should work with that. Okay. Yeah. So in theory, it, you, I'm, I'm looking up, you know, every user has a person record in Siebel. So I'm looking up that person record through the REST API. And I could, in theory, you know, read the position or responsibilities and, and have the application, you know, change the appearance or whatever, or behavior, like, like Siebel does, you know. Pick up that information from the user after login is fine. All right. So, um, yeah, what, what about let's, let's go back to Christian's uh, very nice uh, scenario of not only upgrading a Siebel 2000 application, you intend to upgrade it, right, Christian? Can you tell no, us a little bit? Uh, no, it's from it's coming from IP16. It's, it's running since 20 years, and it got a couple of upgrades. And oh, they they have up, they are running on IP16. Already. Yes, yes. Ah, okay. Yes, IP16.18. So. Okay, but on the last before 17. The, the last, I think there was a dot 19, but. Uh, but, but maybe uh, okay, uh, yeah so so they have to upgrade to Siebel 21 22 <coughs> yes and um, now we have discussion about docker and what are the chance, chances what are the, okay. what, can you do better uh, uh, and uh, now we uh, so they 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 want to move to the to public cloud yes yes and, so uh, in two step maybe one step maybe two steps whatever so uh, there so, are different cloud models. You can go with VM, you can go with Docker, you can right, go with, yes. with Kubernetes for load balancing and things like that. You really can go want with to, Siebel. Yeah, oh, want yeah, to shoot Canon, Canons at Sparrows, you can go with Kubernetes. <laughs> it's so crazy. You can you can think of Docker as a, as a VM and say, okay, I just have a small bunch of Docker, and I, I think this is my Siebel server. Or you can think about microservices and have a yeah. huge bunch of Docker. So, uh, and did they already choose the vendor? Is it like, is it Oracle Cloud or is it it's, Amazon? Or? It's in discussion. Yeah. So we are doing some pilots and it's in okay. discussion. Uh, and, yes. But now we found a limitation because the app, the application is running on Windows. Yeah, and that's not easy to migrate to, let's say, Docker. And <laughs> so we have to, I think the first step will be make it running on a Linux without Docker. Yeah. Okay. So That's I, not hard. That's pretty easy. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, Nick. Uh, I, in, the, in the meantime, I brought up a slide deck on... Um, on uh, Docker, I, I have uh, just to illustrate the evolution now from a uh, Windows traditional. It could be a VM. It's probably VM already on Windows, right? So mm -hmm. you, you're in the middle. You're in the middle of the mm -hmm. evolutionary mm -hmm. step, and the mm -hmm. next evolution is to well decide how big is your container really. No, is the container a whole Siebel server, which is the concept that Oracle has now already in the cloud. Now, if you if you use the ready built images, the Docker images from Oracle, you get this is a, this is a Siebel enterprise image and it can run the Siebel server. 
Uh, but if you think microservices, then of course, yeah, you have probably to go with the Oracle way, the future uh, component services. They, they renamed, if, uh, yes. you know, in the virtual summit, they announced they renamed uh, the cloud native architecture to component services. And that, of course, is a microservice approach where each component, each Siebel component is a pod in a uh, Kubernetes management. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but getting there is the interesting part. Uh, uh, of course, if, if you go with Oracle, they will probably try, try, hopefully successfully, sell you the services they sell to, mm -hmm. to help you with that migration, the, the Oracle Lyft services, because they have that in place. You know, like your Siebel customer you want to go cloud, we, yes. have, we have everything you need. Uh, but if you do it on your own, let's say to, to how would you do it? Let's say a thought experiment, how would it go to Amazon? <laughs> Even if somebody from Oracle looks at that video, they would probably just <laughs> explode. But uh, how would you do it? I, I would start with, let's say migrating the database over. So is the database, is it is it Oracle database? Or? Yes, for sure. Running on Windows, but or... but you also have Microsoft SQL Server on Amazon, so I think you can you can. Yeah, both. but you can run an Oracle database perfectly fine on an Amazon Linux box. You can you can, mig I'm not DBA, but you can migrate the data from one database to the other. So you have a, a copy a copy of your IP16 database on the cloud, and then you would use maybe already the container approach. Uh, to instantiate the um, the machines you need to run the upgrade, but that could be to run the actual upgrade could be a Windows box because you need Siebel tools anyway. Uh, but then the first enterprise you put on the upgraded database uh, could be already Dockerized uh, Siebel on Linux using the um, the Oracle image. Mm -hmm. That that is out, that they provide for each version. Like there's an image mm -hmm. ready to download for twenty one dot eleven. It's just a, just a service request away. <laughs> uh, so it that it is that is one just a thought uh, just as a thought experiment. It's like it's not <laughs> not what you should do, but it, it could be done that way. Do you do you agree? Yes, for sure. Uh, and and what conclusions have you have have you had so far, Christian? So uh, I think two, two steps. So I'm, I'm a little bit struggling with the Windows Linux thing. So we have some 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 special loggings inside. So we have to care about some file paths and CLIP calls, and we have a bunch of mm. Windows batch files that we need to. Convert. Okay, yeah. So it's it's one thing of just so, bringing up a vanilla Siebel on on Linux. That's easy. But then that's easy. But but if you have a running application and there are new things with certificates and with a lot of SOAP web services. So yeah. Well, most of we have to, we have to make run the application again. So yeah, yeah. You need to take a complete inventory, of course. When you when you do an upgrade, you take inventory of all the customizations and interfaces, like you say, SOAP. Uh, yes. The, the SOAP, for example, will have to be migrated to to TLS, uh, HTTPS, if it's not using that already, with IP sixteen. Yeah, yeah. It's and then, of... well, the whole certificate business. I think that's you find some people who can help you with that. <laughs> uh, uh, so, let let me put it that way. So, uh, did anybody in here did this migration? And not to Docker, so just from Windows to Linux. No, but I run both a Windows and a Linux environment. Okay. So I have also customers with mixed environment. So you, you have normally Linux and if you do printing or CTI or things like that, mm -hmm. or sometimes you need some Windows object manager. That's yeah. what we use it for is printing. Uh, 
uh, document stuff. Mm -hmm. A good old document server. <laughs> yes, for sure. So, <laughs> yeah. Things are there to stay. Uh, yeah. It's here to stay, probably. If you, if you don't migrate, let's say, to BI Publisher or whatever, then. but that's yes. complete redesign. And, uh, yeah, so so these file paths, for example, that you mentioned, of course, they're, they're totally different on a Linux box. Yes. Uh, and so you have to, while you do the upgrade project, you have to take care of all these corners in your application. Yes. And make sure they're working. And so that's manual work. Now, there's no like a magic bullet. <laughs> no, bullet. no. Yeah. No. But, but, but on the run, and I think after that, it, it should be stable and working. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Siebel uh, on on Unix or Linux has a long history. Yes. Yeah. yeah. My most recent customer, we moved from Solaris to Linux on Docker, and I had customers years ago where we migrated from Windows to Linux on whenever the Linux version first came out in version eight. Mm -hmm. That was a while ago. Oh uh, yeah. So Solaris sounds interesting to Linux. Yeah. Big it's pretty, I mean, it's, you know, from their perspective, Solaris is similar enough that it wasn't really a big learning curve at all for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. so, I, g g uh, but um, a, ch a challenging project for sure. Yeah, it's not, not just upgrading, but also migrating to different operating system. So, so, so that. Same. So you uh, you start with thinking about an upgrade, and at the end you doing a lift, a shift, and a change of OS. I'm I'm not sure how Oracle <laughs> does it. If they, I think, the approach to move the database to the cloud first and then upgrade it in the cloud already. I, I think that's a, that's not a problem. We have yeah, a controlled uh, development it environment, so um, we we did the repository merge. It's done. On, so, on the dev, so we have a running dev now. And copying a database to any yes. f cloud yes. database, not, a, not yes. an issue, yeah. That's not yes. the issue. Uh, and, but, and we are doing some piloting with, with Oracle and it's, it's very good team spirit and they are fast and handsome and helpful. Yeah. So this is quite good. Okay, good. Maybe, maybe we see a, a blog article some point in time about that experience. <laughs> Maybe, yes, good idea. Yeah, and uh, when when they when they're planning to go live? Very fast. So that's the point. Uh, so, of month. so ne early next year. Yes. Yeah, with 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 a, and uh, I'm I'm interested in that because most upgrade projects like the they have a kind of version freeze when. When you when you have finished upgrading your development environment, you like on twenty one dot, let's say nine mm -hmm. or ten, mm -hmm. and, and then until until go live, that 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 doesn't change anymore. So so you go mm -hmm. live with you decide on on one day in in winter, <laughs> you decide to go live in April with twenty one dot nine. Is, is that this? Do you, do you do it the same way? Yes. Yes. And. So, because like the update, the if you would update all the environments, it's just too risky, right? right. That's 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 a decision that we have to take. Yeah. So, so I, I wonder. That, I mean, I can, I can so, understand. Yeah, as a as a as a European, <laughs> uh, I can understand the, the you you don't want to take the risk. You don't want to risk your upgrade upgrade project by updating the environments before go live to the latest. But, but I've seen in the past, let's say the upgrade takes eight months and they like, they go live and they're already almost one year behind. With, That's a problem. With updates. Yes, and, yes. And, and then yes. they, of course, they are exhausted from the upgrade and mm -hmm. they say, okay, nothing fancy for the next four months, please. <laughs> so <laughs> then they so even, I think... Uh, I think we do a lift, so uh, coming, uh, lifting Siebel, so going to the latest and greatest version that you can get at the time point, that's the lift. Mm -hmm. And do you do the shift to cloud at the same step or later or when? 
that's a mm -hmm. very interesting question that yeah. each project has to solve right yes yeah. for itself and well if you if you're on i think one of the advantages of the docker images especially the the, the ready to use it sounds like using the oracle docker images already I, I hope so. This works. So we have a we have a, a new application with no additional languages. Yeah, because then so, the, the, one of the real benefits of those of those pre-built images is that you can just you know replace the, <laughs> replace the images with the new one, and you're updated, mm -hmm. and, and run post install database update. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, you basically you don't have to go through updating ten Siebel servers. It's just rip. that's the point. Yeah, uh, that's the point. Download the new image and go from there. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's one of the main selling points for the for the Docker images, even if they implement a very big container, an unbelievably big container, with <laughs> that's one entire Siebel server. <laughs> uh, and I, I think another point is uh, saving costs with. Um, uh, CPU cycles. Um, how many containers do you need on on what load? Uh, yeah, of course. If you if you think about the billing in the in the public cloud, yeah, of yes, of course you have to be very aware of each each minute on on the on the CPU costs. <laughs> so in yeah. low, you can have maybe ten containers, and in high volume times, you will have forty. Or yeah, bring them up quickly like and and decommission them quickly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, and also, uh, yeah, you, you all, you all, uh, you all have been on the virtual summit last week, no? I guess. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so yes. The, uh, Oracle has a beta program for customers interested on uh, going to the component services architecture as well with the with the new cloud manager that they plan to bring out. They, they did a nice demo mm -hmm. there, you know, with the mm -hmm. basically lift and lift and shift demo that it was well, it was cool but mm -hmm. at the end you have to do it by yourself like every time yeah but that cloud manager i, I haven't seen it yet live but it, i think it could do um maybe too late for your project but in the future but mm -hmm. also if, if you have that let's say you you go live on on the cloud with the traditional containers let's call them traditional containers <laughs> Uh, Good word. I like this. So yeah, even yeah. Uh, then you could uh, use the the new component services architecture and the cloud manager lift and shift system. I'm I'm speculating here, but I think that's what Oracle intends. You could use it to move to that latest architecture and even benefit if if it's a benefit for the project and microservice usable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's a future scenario that Oracle mm -hmm. just started the beta. <laughs> On that, uh, that's right. I'm looking forward to the to the meetings there and what they will show us. Yeah, uh, I, I saw Frank's uh, Frank's chat message here. A client of his uh, went live earlier this year on 19.8. Yeah, that's exactly the, the that's okay. exactly the syndrome I've I've been describing. Yeah, which is uh, I it doesn't feel right. I mean, <laughs> and uh, Frank, did do they plan to update? Anytime soon to twenty twenty one dot dot latest. Waiting for Frank's chat message here. Uh, <coughs> to speak for for that, um, so we did the upgrade um, in the summer, um, and and we did the yeah we went to uh, twenty dot seven I think uh, twenty one dot seven. Um, for the production upgrade, and uh, we did the um, development upgrade on 19.7, I think. So um, we uh, about a year uh, before. Mm -hmm. So um, we always went on on the um, actual versions, um, always hoping that Oracle has um, found some more bugs that we already had in our environment. Yeah, it's. it's that's the thing about updates. You no, know, you get the bug fixes. <laughs> yeah. So Frank, Frank responds anytime soon is not the right word. They have a peculiar way of doing things, especially when it comes to database updates. So okay, so the DBAs are picky and they don't want a 
random post install database update to mess with <laughs> the database. Yeah. But from my perspective, I really must state, so Oracle has delivered with this continuous code base. So oh. if you are on Siebel 18, it's much more easy to get the next one. Uh, yeah, yeah. So as soon so, as you are on the, on, the on, on, on track, IP 17 and higher, this up, updating is really literally can be counted. The, the effort can be counted in, in person days where uh, yes. an, an upgrade is person years. And that, <laughs> that's a big difference. Yeah. Yes. So, so maybe we did the last big upgrade. Maybe. Hope, hopefully, yes. And I, I think that's what, I can't speak for Oracle really, but I, I, I speculate that that's exactly the reason why, or, well, if, if you look at the uh, Applications Unlimited um, pages of, of Oracle, uh, let me see if I can find them. Uh, you know, uh, Siebel is Applications Unlimited. There it is, yeah. And uh, the others are, uh, maybe some of them are used in your environment, uh, eBusiness Suite, Hyperion, JD Edwards, and PeopleSoft. So there's, there's five applications under this umbrella. And all these, all of these five are under continuous innovation, as it says here. No? Uh, uh, that's just, so Oracle has done it for Siebel and we benefit from that as Siebel customers, but also all the Oracle eBusiness Suite customers get the guarantee from Oracle, at least for the next 10 years, you're under premier support and you get regular updates. I'm not sure if it's monthly for eBusiness Suite, I, I, but I wouldn't be surprised if they have a monthly cadence like they have for Siebel. I, I have no idea, <laughs> but does anybody know? Uh, does anybody is privy to eBusiness Suite, Hyperion, JD Edwards, PeopleSoft? <laughs> Obviously, must be many projects with eBusiness Suite now. Must be thousands of companies still running it, like there are thousands still running Siebel. And so, a big deal on Oracle side, it's not just Siebel, it's very big application suites that literally millions of people are using every day to, to do their work in, in back office or front office or whatever. Yeah. Imagine that. And it's like, uh, the, the the user base of these five applications is is huge. It's mind boggling, and some of these applications come back from the from from the early nineties. Uh, Siebel is mid nineties and uh, still under premier support for for another ten years and getting monthly updates with almost uh, well with with little effort compared to the to the previous upgrade path. So yeah, I think Oracle deserves some praise here, even if it sounds like, yeah, he's, Alex has to praise Oracle. <laughs> uh, let's say kind of respect that they made it. Yeah, yeah, you have to pay them respect to, they're not pulling the plug anytime soon. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's, and that's good for all of us to, to, to yeah, to stay, stay where we are or well, stay where we wanna go with, with the whole cloud migration. So, yes, exciting times ahead. <laughs> All right, on that note, exciting times ahead. Any, anything else uh, you wanna discuss today? Still not convinced about the cloud. <laughs> Still not. Well, I'm, I'm not here to convince you. <laughs> That's that's Oracle sales. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So yeah, I was I was looking at the calendar for next Siebel Friday. It's exactly on thirty first of December. So I'm I'm not sure if anyone will show up, but uh, I would I will announce it. Uh, so you will get get the, the note if it if it's worth doing it or not on New Year's Eve, um, if there's anything worth reporting. Otherwise, uh, definitely we'll do the January Siebel Friday. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you then. And if I, 
don't see you before January. Wish you a uh, you know, very happy holiday season, happy remaining Thanksgiving, and uh, uh, happy new year, maybe. Hopefully. So thank you, Alex. Yeah. Thank, thank you, and you too. You have a good day. Uh, Christmas, y'all. Yeah, and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.